if I didn't know any better, I think you were, well... Confessing my friggin' love to her! Oof. Yikes. Kaguya-sama Love is War is an excellent example of how to take full advantage of a gimmick. I'm sure anyone who's watched a lot of anime will be very familiar with that trope where they over-explain all of their strategy in an internal monologue that's very melodramatic. What? You've lost your mind, Shinomiya! And this show's pretty straightforward right in the title, Love is War. What if two overachieving high school students couldn't confess their love for one another out of fear of being deemed the loser in the relationship? The writing is incredible, it's very funny, and it's a fresh take on an oversaturated market of these high school romance shows. And if that were all this show was, it would be great. But surprisingly, there's way more to it than that. My name is Pei, and today we're talking about when a show offers significantly more than a great gimmick. My first exposure to Kaguya-sama Love is War was with all the hype. People were talking about it constantly and how it was this great new show. It felt like everyone was praising its quality, unique approach, and writing. And when I did watch it for the first time, it was really good. Better than a lot of shows I've seen. Especially slice of life high school romances. I mean, take for example their outros that are all themed in different anime genres. They feel like they have more care and love thrown into them than some entire shows do. But outside of the execution, there's a significant substance to this show that sneaks up on you. Despite what you'd expect, it's wholesome and endearing, and at some points even very heavy. Because what makes Kaguya-sama Love is War so special is the fact that it evolves. So to simplify a little bit what we're going to be talking about today, it's going to fall into three major categories. First, the gimmick. Second, the writing. And third, the product. A cunning ploy. They're both too proud and too stubborn to own up to their feelings. Ah yes, the gimmick. So instead they rely on their wits, deploying clever traps and subtle manipulations. So often in any anime that has an inkling of romance, confessions are drawn out as long as they possibly can be. Circumstances that prevent protagonists from confessing their love to one another become more and more contrived. Because even fireworks have solidified themselves as protagonist arch nemesis, capable of dismantling seasons worth of momentum and build up with a single boom. Because romance writers have realized that longing for love often creates a more interesting setting for conflict than actually being in love. And with each crazy ridiculous explanation for why they can't actually confess to one another, audiences become tired and really frustrated. So what's the solution? Well, you make it so the main protagonist will do anything within their power to not confess first. Kaguya-sama's gimmick is that it's not really a romance story first. Initially, you're not very invested in the characters because they're kind of meant to be unlikable. However, flawed characters are great for comedies. They create fun and interesting circumstance to make things funny. Kaguya-sama follows that old cartoon format where you break each episode into multiple individual stories. In this case, about three six and a half minute sections. Take for example the pilot. They set the stage in this Ivy League-ass Japanese high school where your family name is very important. The two main characters are introduced right away with a couple clear traits. They're cocky, condescending overachievers. And as the president and vice president of the school, everyone seems to look at them with a lot of envy. They're at the top of their class, academically dominant in an incredibly competitive environment. And they take the responsibilities of being part of the student body council very seriously. There are five council members, but we're initially introduced to three. And while the president and vice president are playing a game of tug of war over each other's hearts, the class council secretary, Chika Fujiwara, is completely, blissfully unaware. An agent of chaos packaged in a very cute and likable personality. The first clever little situation is built around two movie tickets. Both parties desperately want to go, but can't be the person to ask the other. Not happening! But my escape routes are blocked on all sides! Looks like I have no choice but to charge forward! The intense score, the excessively dramatic voice lines, and the stylized animation create this really fun situation. Our two main protagonists, Kaguya Shinomiya and Miyuki Shirogane, are essentially doubling down, somehow always having another secret step to their plan. Their conflict is almost like a scene from Yu-Gi-Oh! where a character pushes up his glasses and goes, you triggered my trap card. You only triggered to trigger my another trap card, card which you triggers another trap, trap card. card. Except in this situation in the first episode, Fujiwara is completely unaware of this battle going on between the two main characters. So as they keep one-upping each other, eventually she just pulls the tickets away, offering them a much less romantic option. Fujiwara is a great character, and her chaotic nature is actually essential for the story. She acts as an incredibly important foil to our main character's over-planning. What's also hilarious about it is as Shirogane and Shinomiya are slowly revealing more
more and more of the plan, you end up realizing that Shinomiya planted these tickets to set up this situation. Kaguya-sama Love is War's gimmick essentially takes two super hated tropes in anime and makes them super entertaining. The first being the drawn out love confession that never seems to actually happen, and the second being that melodramatic inner monologue that over explains complex strategies in intense situations. It took me like 12 takes to get that right. So essentially, Kaguya-sama Love is War, a romance show, isn't actually a romance show at first, and the main characters, who are supposed to be likable, are meant to be unlikable. If you think about it, that doesn't sound very compelling, but the show is absolutely fantastic. Every episode of Kaguya-sama Love is War feels packed full of entertainment, and because of the way it's set up, the contrived situations they're constantly thrown into are super fun and also make a lot of sense. So the first part of the pilot episode is the movie tickets. The second is about a anonymous love letter that was left in Kaguya's locker. But I want to jump to the third section. The whole gimmick this time is built around Shirogane's homemade lunch. In kind of that Prince in the Pauper-esque vibe, Shinomiya grew up in an environment that was incredibly overbearing and also very privileged. She desperately wants to try a homemade lunch. For example, she deeply craves those little hot dogs that are cut up to look like octopuses. This gimmick is once again super fun, and it showcases that right from the start, Kaguya-sama Love is War was really strong. We get that fun strategic dynamic between Shinomiya and Shirogane right away, and once again, Fujiwara is thrown into the mix to make everything more complicated. It's hard to properly express how funny this show is by explaining it, because, you know, we all know that explaining comedy totally works well. But this show functions initially as a remarkable parody. Anime as a medium actually lends itself heavily to parody given such distinct trends and norms. I know comparison is fickle and easy to disagree with, so take this next point with a grain of salt. Kill La Kill is an anime I've never watched, but I've seen a lot of people discuss it online. A lot of Kill La Kill fans originally believed it to be parody, and as the show went on it felt like public sentiment from fans shifted. People started to claim that it was just becoming the show that it originally made fun of. I'm not here to make overgeneralizations about a show I've never watched, but taking that concept of a parody show becoming what it's making fun of, that absolutely applies to Kaguya-sama Love is War, except in this case it doesn't make the show worse, it actually just makes it better. And it also kind of feels like they set it up from the start, because in the first episode, they start building a foundation for what the show will eventually be. And they don't bail on the satire characters, they kind of do the opposite, they just provide depth and context. I don't know, I just think that's pretty cool, especially since I didn't notice the first time I watched. For example, right from the beginning, they set up this dynamic and class difference between Shirogane and Shinomiya. Oh, that's right, you're poor. This is a really important reoccurring theme, and comes up consistently throughout the rest of the story. When applied to the gimmick, it essentially gives the answer to why both parties are being so hard-headed because each character's traits are baked into the writing and story. The five student council members in this show are all built around archetypes. The privileged princess with a built-in superiority complex, the arrogant overworker who gets to the top and acts like you don't know nobody, <laughs> the likable, charismatic airhead, the dark, melodramatic, and awkward shut-in, and finally the pompous, high horse, tattletale. This show is built around those archetypes, and the characters to some degree are very true to those personality traits. And at first, when I was introduced to them, I found them borderline incredibly annoying. But they're all really essential for making the gimmick as compelling as it was. And by the time you actually start to get tired of it, they've already started to move on by adopting a more complicated story with depth. As the episodes progress and you spend more time around the characters, you start to realize why they all like each other so much. In my first watch through, I kind of stumbled into that, and what makes it really compelling is the fact that it doesn't come at the subversion of the negative traits we've been introduced to. While there is character growth, they don't just magically change major components of who they are. A big part of why you go to like the characters is just providing the context into their personality, a mix of the environment they grew up in and their goals as individuals. I love when good characters are built around interesting faults. There are so many parts of this show that are really engaging and entertaining, and the gimmick works for a very long time. And even when they actually end up kind of moving past it, they really don't. The core of the story is still this stubborn battle between two characters that are trying to deal with the fact that they're excited and scared of this new feeling that they're processing. Love in all forms is pretty complicated, and I think what love is shifts throughout your life. 
But part of what makes this such a good love story is the fact that it's built around other things that are significantly strong. Because the gimmick ends up kind of not being a gimmick in the end. It's written with the characters in a way that really feels in touch with their stories, and you really grow to love everyone involved. It's not just the main characters that are appealing. The ensemble cast is really compelling. The student council and these games that are being played each episode are the foundation for their closest friendships. But before I get too ahead of myself and start talking about why I think the writing for this show is so good, I want to talk about how the gimmick is built off of really, really solid execution. As a big fan of anime, a lot of the comedy shows I tried in the past didn't really hit, but Kaguya-sama is hilarious. I'm now in that department of watching enough anime where most dubs seem noticeably worse, but Kaguya-sama's dub is fantastic, especially the narrator. I think it'll be fun. We're only 12 minutes into episode one, but I think we know her well enough to know she's lying. As if I would really go. And don't get me wrong, while I enjoyed the dub a lot, I don't think it's necessarily the best way to watch the show. I still think the sub is a bit better, but it's cool to have a good dub. Also a bit of a tangent, I just found out that dubs aren't reanimated, meaning they have to match the pacing and the mouth movement of the original animated sub. Maybe that's super obvious and I'm stupid for not knowing that, but for some reason that clarifies so much about why pacing for dubs is so awkward. Sorry, sidetracked, where was I? Oh, right. While the dub is fantastic, the sub is also outstanding. And while there's lots of things to praise, and today we will be talking about lots of things, what really stands out to me the most now, having rewatched it for the second time, is the way the show evolves. What originally made me fall in love with Kaguya-sama Love is War was the execution of the premise. I went into watching this show assuming it would be a bit single tone, but what I find fascinating is that a lot of the reasons I loved the show initially, I think don't hold up as much as I thought they would. Take for example these shots where they emulate different directing styles. This one's obviously referencing horror films, with things like added film grain, scan lines, and higher contrast. Then there's this shot following it, the close-up wide-angle slow-turning doorknob, and then this shot has the saturation pulled out so the red really pops following it. This originally kind of sold me on the show because it felt like no one else was doing it, but now it's become more common. So when I say it doesn't hold up, it's not because it's gotten worse in retrospect, it's because my standards have shifted. This show is still great and still very entertaining, but I think that we live in a day and age where a lot of great anime is being made, and the floor for what expectations are and quality have risen a lot. Bochi the Rock, Chainsaw Man, Cyberpunk Edgerunners, Jujutsu Kaisen, Skip and Loafer. These are just some of many different shows that are raising the standard of anime released, and they're coming from all sorts of different genres. So Kaguya-sama's great execution makes it stand out less than it used to in the past. But that's not a void that was left empty, because the substance of Kaguya-sama Love is War really holds up. It's a wholesome show with great characters that at first you don't like but grow to love. The drama is set up really well and doesn't often feel shoehorned. And while there is depth to this show, it also captures an incredibly nostalgic feeling of being a teenager hanging out with your friends. It's an overwhelmingly fun show that offers a lot of wholesome moments and more than anything a surprising amount of depth. With three seasons in a movie that have been released, they have really started to explore some pretty complex ideas. With the occasional miss and a couple weird moments, mostly they teach really good lessons. And at the foundation of all of these different aspects of the show is the chemistry between the characters. Most of the story takes place in the student council room and it's kind of carried by the gimmick. To limit characters primarily to one location means that you need to have have great writing, and Kaguya-sama Love is War has great writing. How would you define great writing? I think it's a harder question than it seems. Maybe you'd start with the five elements of storytelling. Or maybe you'd talk about prose, like the literal text on the page or the dialogue being spoken. Please eat it, President. No, I think you should be the one to have it. Maybe it's about tone, style, and emotional resonance. Whatever your perspective is on good writing, I think you can largely break it up into two categories, storytelling and prose. Ever since I was a kid, I've tried to pay a lot of attention to writing and stories because it was important to me. It also helped that I was surrounded by other people who cared a lot about writing too. It's a subjective art, and while they'll never be an absolute, that doesn't stop people like me from trying to create more objective ways of measuring things. The reason I think Kaguya-sama Love is War is so well written is because of how much it emotionally resonated with me when I was watching it, and when I revisited it, how much it held up to extreme scrutiny as I started to dive deeper into understanding its storytelling structure. That's just kind of a convoluted way to say that I really enjoyed the story, and when I dove deeper, I was very impressed. 
So the goal of this next section, and in the larger picture, the video in its whole, is to try to understand better my subjective experience through analysis. So let's revisit those five elements of storytelling I quickly brushed over before. Plot, characters, conflict, setting, and theme. All of which have overwhelming amounts of depth. I think it's a fun exercise to look at different stories and try to order which of these different five components were most important and prioritized. Can you make a case for one of them being foundational for a story? Take Avatar The Last Airbender for example. While it definitely has compelling plot, conflict, and themes, I think you could argue a pretty solid case that setting and character were prioritized. And if I had to choose one that was foundational to Avatar's writing, I would say setting. This might seem surprising, I think most people would say the characters in Avatar are one of their favorite parts, but I think at the center of all of the story is the setting. The world building is so magnificent that the plot felt like it was almost written to allow the characters to explore the vast cultures and world around them. Death Note might be a great example of a story that prioritizes conflict. Brandon Sanderson's novels are often built around elaborate and super engaging plot. And it's important to note, while I do think that certain stories prioritize specific things, that doesn't mean that they're weak in other places. Some are, but most of the time good stories are pretty compelling when it comes to all of these different subjects. But that being said, it's also not super uncommon for good stories to occasionally compromise on one of these things. Which leads us back to Kaguya-sama Love is War. What's prioritized in this show? I think a good place to start is in the conflict, which this show is very upfront about. Two incredibly smart and overconfident high school students like each other and will do anything within their means to not be the person to admit it first. I think it's one of the two aspects of storytelling that apply most to what we were talking about at the beginning of this video, the gimmick. Part of what makes it so interesting is that often the conflict in the story is multifaceted. It interacts with characters and plot constantly. Take for example this scene that's in every single video essay I've watched so far about Kaguya-sama Love is War. I originally didn't want to put it in the video because it's been used so much, but then I realized why everyone's been using it so much. Because it's a great example of the character's dynamic early in the show. In the fifth episode of season one, we find our main two characters once again conniving. It's a rainy day and it's a romantic tradition to share an umbrella with someone you have a crush on. Obviously with these crazy and intense stakes, it's a perfect setting for conflict. And soon an intense battle will be waged between two very intellectual main characters. Both characters in an attempt to get the other to suggest sharing an umbrella first act like they have forgotten theirs. Except for the fact that they do it at the exact same time. And suddenly they find themselves in a stalemate. Neither party is willing to admit the fact that they lied and that they do actually have an umbrella. Boom. Conflict. While the stakes may not be high, our characters sure as hell don't treat it that way. They both quickly realize that the other person is very likely lying, and now it's become a race to convince the other person to admit it first. And then they weaponize their understanding of one another to try to poke holes in each one's explanation as to why they're here on a rainy day without an umbrella. This entire scene, from the writing to the animation and music, is meant to feel like a scene out of a thriller like Death Note. Each comeback they have feels like a bullet loaded into the chamber. For example, Shirogane knows that Shinomi is one of the most meticulous planners he knows, so the chances of her car getting a flat and then her forgetting an umbrella seems highly unlikely. However, Kaguya came way too prepared. She prayed for rain, checked the forecast, pierced the tire on her family car, and then checked the bike rack to see if Shirogane had ridden his bike to school. Not only is this a fun situation, it demonstrates a lot about our characters. Shirogane rides his bike every day to school, and if not, takes the train. Shinomiya has a private driver. It demonstrates a ton of these characters' personality, and that's especially true when Chika Fujiwara shows up to ruin Shinomiya's plan. As soon as all their preparation is out the door, suddenly they're just innocent and awkward teenagers sitting next to their crush, seeing if they can share an umbrella. The conflict in Kaguya-sama Love is War is multifaceted and compelling. It's one of multiple parts that heavily contribute to this show's remarkable writing. There's a video by a channel named Brandon Talks that focuses on Kaguya-sama's comedy. I'm not sure how much I agree with everything he said, but he made some points that I thought were really compelling. One of which he argued was that there's a difference between a comedy and a funny show, saying that funny shows are capable of telling funny jokes, whereas comedies have humor written into the plot. I think there's truth to this argument. I think my favorite comedies often exist in funny premises. They're not just a collection of jokes. In some way, the humor is baked into the plot. That's why I think there's a difference between, let's say, Marvel films that have funny moments and comedies like Kaguya-sama Love is War. I think a good example of this is a scene from season one, episode four. The student body council is holding an event for French exchange students, and Fujiwara thinks it's a good idea to dress up in some cosplay. Cat ears. Yeah.
Both Shinomiya and Shirogane are very embarrassed to put them on, thinking they don't look very good. And the response their crush gives seems to indicate that is the case. But in reality, the muted responses are coming from the fact that the main characters are crumbling under the cuteness of their crush in cat ears. I think it's a premise that lends itself to comedy beyond just a punchline. And while I directly mentioned plot before, I think that this applies to all five elements of storytelling. I like when humor works in conjunction with the story. I think it adds depth. There's a great video from Every Film a Painting that analyzes Edgar Wright's filmmaking. To oversimplify the point the video was making for the sake of time, Edgar Wright as a director uses a range of different tools available to make jokes funny outside of just written lines. Some obvious examples are physical gags and cinematography. And I think that this idea of using the tools available to you to make something funnier beyond just a written joke absolutely applies to Kaguya-sama Love is War, and to comedy writing in general. And while they do use similar tools like cinematography and physical gags, I'm focused focusing instead on how they use humor to complement the story and vice versa. She's a repulsive, cancerous growth upon our world. Would you like to come with us too, Kaguya? Would I? I love when stories offer emotional diversity. They're not too single tone. And I think that's part of what makes Kaguya-sama's evolution so interesting to me. And center to that transformation is the writing. And the foundation of the writing, in my opinion, is the characters. I think this story is character driven. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Earlier I mentioned that I'm going to be breaking up writing into two categories. The first being storytelling and the second being prose. In season one, episode eight, there's this great example of written prose. When I first watched the episode, I remember stopping and going, hmm. That's good writing. Essentially, it follows our first four council members as they prepare for exams. And it's all written around this phrase. He's lying. She's lying. He's lying. She's telling the truth. Exams at Shuchin Academy are not only important for the future of each student, but also an incredible signal to the rest of their class where they stand. This episode juxtaposes how each character is posturing before the exams versus actually what's going on internally. For example, should Ogane's acting like you shouldn't have to prepare at all for an exam, you should be diligent year round, that anyone preparing last minute is actually trying to cover up their failure throughout the semester. He's lying. In reality, Shirogen is actually exhausted, having spent the last 10 days off work grinding his ass off in an environment where status is very important. He overworks to compensate for his lack of status. And it's not just Shirogen. Shinomiya doesn't miss a beat either. Cramming to try and inflate your score seems counterintuitive to me. She's lying. This is unusual for her, but she's taking the finals very seriously. The line is funny the first two times it hits, but it gets even better because immediately they move on to Ishigami. I'm studying harder than I ever have, honestly. He's lying. The only thing he'll be applying himself to is his new video game. And then finally Fujiwara comes along, believing everything that people are saying, completely unaware of the battle going on, a sad casualty of the academic warfare and subterfuge being weaponized by her surrounding top achieving classmates. Yes! I'm not gonna study one bit! She's telling the truth. I just think it's great writing. And it's not just the prose, this actually applies to the character writing too, because this episode is an incredibly insightful one for the audience. We learn that Shirogane is trying to prove himself, chasing acceptance from his peers, especially Shinomiya when it comes to status. His position as student council president and top student in his class work to counteract his insecurity and validate the fact that he deserves to be there. Fujiwara almost feels like a control group in a scientific study. She's surrounded by characters who bear heavy weight on their shoulders. And while she has interesting character faults, generally speaking, she seems secure and happy in who she is. The other student council member's relationship with this test seems to carry a certain daunting magnitude. For Fujiwara, her main concern is whether or not she'll lose more of her allowance if her grades continue to drop. Ishigami is also really interesting because he's on the verge of being held back if he flunks a single test. Now this is the setting for what I think is the start of a very interesting character dynamic between Ishigami and Shinomiya. Despite her genius and her best efforts, she has yet to top Shirogane even once. A crucial part of Shinomiya's character is her natural proclivity towards success. It's a mix of environment, inclination, and intense pressures. From an early age, she's been taught to win. Being a creature of pride, that kind of defeat is an unforgivable disgrace to her. This episode moves really quickly, and before we know it, we find out that Shirogane once again topped the class. And though she'd never admit it, Shinomiya is actually heartbroken. It's one thing to lose when you're not trying very hard, but when you put a lot of effort into something and still come up short, it's gut-wrenching. 
Part of what makes this such remarkable writing is that everything I just shared doesn't even take up half an episode. It only takes six minutes of runtime. When they're showcasing the results that Shinomi is still second and Shodogane ranked first, they slip in Fujiwara and Ishigami's class ranks as well. To no surprise, Fujiwara, a casualty of academic warfare, did worse. But surprisingly, Ishigami did better. The episode rewinds a little bit and it showcases how Ishigami did better. We see Kaguya overhearing the fact that Ishigami might be held back if he fails one of his tests. So Kaguya makes it her mission to see Ishigami succeed. At this point in the story, Ishigami is terrified of Shinomiya, having accidentally gotten her away a couple times in her attempted conquest of Shirogane's love. So she starts to tutor Ishigami, and this works really well not only for comedy beats, but also in the character's development. Ishigami ends up actually doing much better on the test, and starts to believe in himself, because ultimately, Ishigami's storyline is about self-doubt and self-worth. It's all capstoned with this awesome scene at the end of the episode. Multiple students, whispering and sharing rumors, are judging Kaguya and Ishigami studying together in the library. Saying that it might damage her reputation, Ishigami warns her that spending time with him publicly might not be in her best interest. If you have something to say to me, go ahead. You have my attention now. The same traits that originally made me dislike Kaguya now lead me to love her. Oh, I see. You were worried. But I don't judge people based on what others say about them. I prefer to make my own assessments and I've deemed Ishigami to be the kind of person I want to spend my time with. Surely you girls aren't doubting my judgment. <laughs> Let's go. It's just an incredible moment to cap off an already remarkable episode. There's also another great example of written prose in season two, episode one. Fujiwara, who's part of the tabletop gaming club, comes with a prototype for a new game that she wants to play in the student council room. It's essentially a homemade version of the game Life. And after Shirogane and Shinomiya both turn Fujiwara down, Ishigami convinces everyone that it would actually be fun to play and to give it a shot. Then in the first round, Ishigami lands on a misfortune square, pulls a car accident, and rolls a one out of six chance of dying, instantly taking him out of the game. What happens when you die? Other than losing the game and being in last place, nothing. Uh, I see. After going out of his way to convince everyone to play, he's knocked out in the first round. He then asks for the game manual and proceeds to watch everyone else play for the rest of the time and clarify rules when they apply. Kaguya spends the rest of the game landing on lucky squares and essentially winning, but not getting what she really wants, which is to end up with Shirogane, who ends up getting screwed by the game. He lands on a marriage tile, ends up marrying Fujiwara in the game. They have nine children, which is a callback to earlier, and then eventually she lands on a divorce card and now he has to pay childcare for all nine children. The way the game is playing out kind of represents each character's fears. Kaguya is living a lucky life, but not in the way she desires most. Shirogane is terrified of unsustainable financial pressure, poverty, and debt, only to be drowned in it. And poor Ishigami didn't even have a chance to play. All the while, Fujiwara is having a blast. Everyone ends up pretty upset, but in the end, Ishigami ends up giving genuine feedback for how it played as a game. You could amp up strategy by letting players pull one dice roll. Okay. Speaking of die, that sudden death element needs to go. It's just great writing. And also it ties in perfectly where I'm going next in the video, which is talking about our characters. Earlier I posited a question about whether or not there was a foundational element of storytelling that Kaguya-sama Love is War was built around, and I do believe there is. Despite trying to talk about a bunch of different aspects of the writing, pretty consistently I end up mentioning characters here or there. It is part of everything that I like about this show. And I think that this episode showcases a character that I think is really intriguing, Ishigami. His story and background is really when I feel like the show made a major tonal change. And while there were hints at the depth of the show would eventually explore in the first and second season, it really comes together near the end of the second season. So before we explore other characters and their relationships with one another, I want to talk about Yu Ishigami. Not all great stories have outstanding side characters, but it seems like almost every story with remarkable side characters ends up being great. Ishigami is one of multiple side characters in Kaguya-sama Love is War that's outstanding, to the point where it almost feels insulting to call him and the rest of the ensemble cast side characters. Remember earlier how I said Kaguya-sama follows that cartoon format of 20 minute episodes broken into three six and a half minute segments? Well the only exception to that in the first season is the finale, and in the second season the only exception is an episode dedicated specifically to Ishigami. Earlier I mentioned that I love when shows offer emotional diversity. I love when stories offer emotional diversity. Yep, there, said it about 20 minutes in. And while we get hints of that before this moment dedicated to Ishigami's story, I think that this is when it really solidified the perspective that they weren't going to shy away from heavy topics and emotional depth. Ishigami's dedicated story takes place in the 11th episode of season 2, but in the two episodes before it, we get little segments as precursors to Ishigami's dedicated episode. 
First, we see Ishigami putting himself out there, joining a student club on a whim, one that at first seems counter to his personality, the cheer squad. The ones who take it seriously are fine, but the ones who don't. Multiple times, he's almost convinced to quit. Small amounts of friction feel giant and insurmountable, but tiny actions of kindness from those around him are enough to encourage him to keep going. Like one of the members of the cheer squad going out of her way to get his email because he doesn't use their main form of communication, Instagram. This character is actually going to be incredibly important later in the story. The cheer squad decides for their performance that they're going to swap uniforms with students of the opposite gender, which means Ishigami needs to find a female student willing to lend him her uniform. With only a couple female friends in the entire school, all of which in the student council, this once again feels like an insurmountable task. He walks the student halls talking to himself about the options before Kaguya hears him say her name. To his surprise, Kaguya is actually very willing to share her uniform with him, and actually it starts off as a very heartwarming moment before his social ineptitude leads to him saying something insulting. Even so, it still remains an incredibly wholesome moment where Shinomi and Ishigami really start to feel like friends. In the next episode, we look through the eyes of Kobachi Osaragi, the best friend of the fifth council member we've yet to talk about. We'll cover her character in a little bit. I instead want to focus on Osaragi's perspective on Ishigami. She shares that the rumors surrounding Ishigami is that he stalked a girl to the point of obsession, which eventually culminated in him getting in a fight with her boyfriend, beating him pretty badly. But she has her reservations. Suspiciously. Ishigami elected to never give his side of the story. Her doubts are matched with her observations. While Ishigami demonstrated idealistic traits and social ineptitude, he was also kind and seemed to be very morally driven. Something wasn't adding up in Osaragi's perspective, so she goes out of her way to reach out to a couple members of the cheer squad. Her interacting with these characters actually comes back later. And she expresses that she doesn't think Ishigami joined this group as a joke. To some degree, she's rooting for his success and wants the people around him to know that he's genuinely putting himself out there. When someone's been hurt in the past, it doesn't take much to discourage them from doing things they need to do for themselves. And while many people go out of their way to support Ishigami throughout his story, ultimately it needs to start with himself. All of this prefaces episode 11. Shushin Academy is hosting a sports festival. The episode jumps between his past and present. Ishigami's closed off nature is represented by the people around him being faceless. And in exploring his past, we learn the true story behind Yu Ishigami. Back in middle school, Ishigami regularly interacted with a girl named Kyoko Otomo. Her vibrant and friendly personality broke through his introverted tendencies, resulting in her having a pretty positive impact on Ishigami's life. At one point, he even says, in a way, she saved me. In a way, she saved me. Generally, Ishigami, consistent with his character introduced in the first season, resents couples. But when Kyoko gets into a relationship, her happiness overrides his disdain. Well, that's only until he finds out that her boyfriend is cheating on her. So given Ishigami's idealistic nature and strong sense of justice, he decides to confront this cheater. An important note is that Ishigami was not in love with this girl. He's actually quoted saying, if only I had been in love. If only I'd been in love, things would have been a lot less complicated. I think this is an incredibly important distinction, as characters that share that archetype with Ishigami so often have kindness that feels exceptionally conditional, where the obsessive pedestalization of people they love lead to an incredibly fickle sense of morality. Unlike so many other characters who are similar to Ishigami, he's not doing this because he's in love. In actually a very noble place, he's doing it to try to pass forward the kindness that he felt he received. But he also clarifies this wasn't some altruistic mission either. Multiple times he acknowledges his strong sense of justice, as well as his quote, baseless confidence and pride. As much as I admire Ishigami's morals, to some degree the reason he's inserting himself into this situation is because of his own ego. And admirable or not, it ends up backfiring. Now here's a piece of information I didn't notice the first three times watching this scene, but in the fourth rewatch for this video, I realized he confronts this cheater with an SD card. This implies that he has visual proof, either photos or video of this guy cheating, and given Ishigami's tech literacy, he for sure has backups of that information. So when Ishigami chooses not to come forward with those details, it gets rid of any doubt as to the intention behind his action. Now in this confrontation, a couple of major things happen. First, the cheater, assuming Ishigami is in love with this girl, uses uses his girlfriend as a bargaining chip. Second, he weaponizes compromising footage of this girl that if it were to leak would have serious adverse effects on her entire life. And third, this situation is not going how Ishigami had planned it. All he was asking is the cheater stop cheating. And when he refuses, dehumanizes her, and then tries to use her as a bargaining chip, Ishigami reaches a breaking point and attacks him. 
After being attacked, Kyoko's boyfriend creates this narrative that Ishigami was obsessed and stalking her. And with the threat of the compromising footage of Kyoko being leaked looming over Ishigami's head, he doesn't feel comfortable sharing his side of the story. He was suspended from school and given an opportunity to return as soon as he writes Kyoko's boyfriend an apology. Based in principle and maybe pride, Ishigami refuses. And I don't think many of us disagree with that decision. Unable to go back to school, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. In this case, literally in a dark room by himself. The people around him, unable to understand the full context, fail Ishigami. And quickly, his mental health deteriorates. He blames himself. He feels crazy. As an audience, knowing this now, it, it heavily influences our entire understanding of the character. There's kind of this reoccurring theme in Kaguya-sama Love is War that characters often contain multitudes. There's more depth to someone's story than you may realize. It runs in conjunction with that thing I mentioned earlier, where the characters that we're introduced to, that we originally dislike, actually become very likable, not because they change the core of who they are, but because we learn to understand them better. After months of suspension, holding out and refusing to write the apology, Ishigami finds himself breaking. Narratives can run away quick, and sometimes it feels like you have no agency. And then there's hope. The president shows up and knocks on his door. He and the student council have created a report of what they think actually went down. Now this is all juxtaposed to real time what's happening with Ishigami at the sports festival. Kyoko Otomo shows up having transferred last year to a different school system after all of the drama to confront Ishigami, someone she thought caused a lot of harm in her life. And in that confrontation, all the momentum Ishigami had built in joining the student council and then eventually joining the cheer squad is killed. Everyone's faces, even those of his closer friends, disappear as Ishigami shuts off from the people around him. He's then used last minute to fill in the relay race as the anchor. He's spiraling and losing control. More than anything, he wants to go home. And the president shows up in his time of need, just like he did in the past, and those scenes run in conjunction. Ishigami remembers what Shirogane wrote in Big Marker across his required apology. And when Kyoko shows up again to heckle Ishigami, he takes a deep breath and tells her to go to hell. Go to hell, dumbass. <laughs> In that moment, he accepts the past and chooses to fight for a future where he gets to live a happy life, one where he doesn't beat himself up for trying to do the right thing. Taking the baton and racing to catch up to the leader, Ishigami wants to prove that he's not a loser anymore, that he's capable of mounting a comeback, only to come up inches short. But this episode was never about winners and losers. It's about perseverance, continuing to put yourself out there and trying to grow and live a happy life, acknowledging your past, accepting it, and moving beyond it. Life is complicated and people are far from perfect. People trying to do good things are constantly limited in their understanding of a situation and their capability to positively impact it. In no way does that remove them from the responsibility of their actions. All you can do is acknowledge your past, try to learn from it, and continue to try to be good to people. Some people came away from these episodes in a very different place than I did. Kyoko Otomo is not a villain. She had a limited understanding of the situation, she wasn't given the full picture, and I don't think that's her responsibility. Ishigami made the decision not to tell her the full story. Her confronting the hardships of her past I think is a good thing, and Ishigami's willingness to be the villain in her story, not needing to clarify this, understanding that it might hurt her more, I'm not sure it's the right decision, but I do think it's a noble one, and I don't say that to imply that telling her is a better decision. I think this is incredibly complicated and there aren't clear answers. There's that line from the president that says, let's, let's not, not debate, debate the righteousness, righteousness of your actions. actions. It's incredibly hard to determine what the right thing to do is in a situation like this. But both Kyoko Otomo and Ishigami both deserve to live happy lives, pursuing growth and joy. And it's okay that she sees him as a villain. The world in a lot of ways is incredibly unfair and it's really important to encourage people to do their best with the situations presented to them and to learn from their experiences. Acknowledging the ways in which you've hurt people, even when it's debatable whether or not you're at fault, is the kind thing to do. Consistently striving not to hurt people in the future, learning and acknowledging your previous mistakes, and forgiving yourself when you do make mistakes is part of being a human. To explore something so emotionally complex and deep is, I think, very ambitious from Kaguya-sama Love is War, especially since I think in a lot of ways they navigated it pretty well. This isn't what I expected when I started watching the show. And my god, are these characters incredibly compelling. Ishigami's growth doesn't stop there. He continues to develop and the relationships between him and other characters are incredibly interesting. And when you go back and watch the series again, knowing this and keeping it in mind, you see all the little battles that Ishigami's taking in putting himself back out there consistently. It's beautiful and optimistic and an incredibly fun journey to analyze. 
I don't think the president saved Ishigami. I think he was one of many people that offered moments of kindness. And I don't say that to diminish the effects of Shirogane's actions. The point I'm trying to make is that Ishigami, after the president helped him, had to get up and fight every single day. He didn't just move past that trauma. The person most capable and responsible for helping him is himself. And he does an outstanding job. And that level of depth is so cool. And he's just one of many characters in Kaguya-sama Love is War with incredibly awesome arcs. This is what I meant when I said earlier that the void isn't left empty. This is why I love this show. I'd say there are six primary characters in Kaguya-sama Love is War. So far, I've mentioned Shirogane, Shinomiya, Ishigami, and Fujiwara. And there are two crucial characters that I've kind of neglected up to this point. Ai Hayasaka and Miko Ino. The premise behind Hayasaka's character is arguably the least believable part of the story. Hayasaka is Shinomiya's maid, and while I'm unsure of how long she's been working, it's kind of implied that it's been more of a life thing than anything else, which based off of Japanese labor laws doesn't really seem possible. I'll be the first to admit the fact that I don't know very much about upper society. Is it normal to have a teenage girl work full time as a maid for an upper class family? Or go to the same high school as her? Or secretly be a highly capable spy and bodyguard? I don't know. I'm not pretending to know. It does, however, feel unrealistic to me. That being said, Hayasaka is a pretty great character, especially when you explore her relationships with the characters around her. It's also interesting how she's the only character that seems to be fully aware of the dynamic going on between Shinomi and Shirogane. Fujiwara and Ishigami are blissfully unaware of the dynamic battle going on between the president and vice president. While other characters like Shirogane's father kind of figures it out at a certain point, the only characters that are really aware of what's going on is Hayasaka and maybe if you consider him a character, the narrator. She constantly gets put into these very unrealistic situations because of the circumstance of her character, like at first trying to seduce the president before they become close friends because Kaguya challenges her, or having to dress up as a man every single time Fujiwara comes over to spend the night so that she doesn't pick up on the fact that Hayasaka goes to the same school as them. And actually those two situations make for a very funny episode in season 3, where Fujiwara presumes that whoever the president's been talking to a lot is someone he's in love with, and that person ends up being Hayasaka. All I know is their name and that he's in love with them. Which she knows as Mr. Hayasaka, the assistant who at one point committed to her role convinced Fujiwara that he's gay. I'm afraid you've misunderstood. I only have romantic feelings for men. So that Fujiwara doesn't assume that Kaguya and him have a secret relationship. And by him, I mean her. And by her, I mean Hayasaka. But Fujiwara thinks that the president is attracted to Hayasaka, who she thinks is a man, but he isn't. And by he isn't, I mean Shirogane isn't attracted to Hayasaka. But Hayasaka does actually kind of like him. Everything clear? No? Okay, moving on. Something I really do love about Hayasaka's character is first of all her self-discovery, because while I think the circumstance for the character feels very unrealistic, the reaction to that circumstance feels like how an actual person would respond. She gets a lot of really cool moments in the story, and actually Hayasaka's relationship with Shinomiya is really interesting as both her friend and her employee. Shinomiya and Hayasaka are brought up and exist in a very cold environment, a situation that's ruled by status, standards, and power. No one really knows Shinomiya like Hayasaka does. And for a good portion of the story, no one really knows Hayasaka. And that's part of what makes her friendship with Shirogane so interesting is she learns to start fighting for herself. And I think there's a beautiful lesson in that story and a character that I really actually grew to love. The last of the six primary characters is Miko Ino. She's introduced later than the rest of the primary cast in season two, and it feels like she follows that same arc that the rest of the characters did, where at first they are kind of unlikable, and then as you grow to know them, the character grows on you a lot. Miko Ino is a tattletale. She's all about people following rules. Since middle school, she's been part of the public morals committee, and one of Miko's main core traits is innocence. There's this running bit once she joins the student council, where she consistently walks in on the other council members at the worst possible time. Take for example the first time she walked into the council room. Hello. He's a rotten man boy. <laughs> While the misunderstandings work perfectly with the show's humor, the best place to start to understand Miko Ino as a character is in her main first episode. Ino's one of the only characters that consistently stands up to both Shinomiya and Shirogane. Now the episode we're primarily going to be focusing on is season 2 episode 6, but there's two precursors we should focus on before then what the narrator refers to as the election arc. In season two, episode four, we're introduced to Miko Ino almost as if she's a supervillain. She immediately strikes a nerve with Shirogane and they get into a little heated debate. The intense soundtrack, 
the quick back and forth, the tension you could cut with a knife, it's a fun scene. It's also all made better by the fact that Miko Ino is like 4'8", and every time she says something that bothers Shirogane, it brings him a step lower. She really holds her own and doesn't back down, which is kind of cool to see, because Shirogane has been kind of pedestalized by the student body. Then suddenly Miko Ino, who's very familiar with Fujiwara, asks her to be her vice president if she wins. Turns out Ino kind of idolizes Fujiwara. It all ends with Ino seemingly winning the argument, and the president deciding to take her pretty seriously before Ishigami points out what's on the flyer she was trying to hand out earlier. Ino's policies are super idealistic. She wants all male students to shave their heads, cell phones not to be accessible on campus, and mandatory bag checks. The episode ends with the narrator explaining that while Shirogane was already winning the election, he starts to dominate more despite or even because Miko's efforts. The following episode, Shinomi approaches Ino trying to convince her to drop out of their race. And Ino holds her own, and they sneak a little bit of comedy in there too. Both you and ex President Shirogane are a real match made in heaven! <gasps> Earlier, I said that there were only two fully dedicated episodes that aren't broken into parts before Ishigami's. I was wrong. Season 2, Episode 6 is dedicated to concluding this election arc. Ino's being built up as this antagonist, a potential threat to the student council continuing. And there's all this buildup. Osaragi, Ino's best friend, gives a speech on why she would make a great president. Then Kaguya gives a better one. Slowly the hype is building before Ino finally gets on stage, and then they reveal the fact that she has this snowballed version of stage fright Every year she runs for student council, and every year she loses. She's terrified to talk in front of the student body. The election is all but secured. But Ishigami, who famously has a terrible relationship with Ino, to the point where they hate one another, still is bothered by the fact that people are making fun of her for caring and trying despite her fears. This leads the Shirogane playing the villain, going on stage, and debating with Ino. And as soon as they start going back and forth, she gets into the same tempo she had been in before, and she really holds her own. She makes a comeback and still loses the election, but it was pretty close. It's actually this really cute moment where, for the first time, some members of the student body are on her side. One of Ino's core character traits is her strong will. She was able to withstand constant criticism and resistance from the entire student body up to the point of hate because she believed what she was doing was right. It's a great way to introduce a character who continues to evolve and eventually solidifies herself as absolutely being a character interesting enough to be part of the six major cast members. Part of what makes Ino a great character is she's a fresh perspective on all the dynamic relationships between our ensemble cast. And not only that, she also has her own really interesting relationships with some of the characters herself. And this show is carried by all the dynamic relationships between the characters. Take for example Shirogane and Shinomiya. Love is war. It's in the title of the show. They both like each other and will fight tooth and nail not to admit it. And then Shinomiya's relationship with Fujiwara. Shinomiya being fiery, vindictive, and incredibly scary. And Fujiwara being completely socially unaware of those things. While Fujiwara is blissfully unaware, Kaguya is dreadfully aware. This leads to situations where Shinomiya goes from loving to hating Fujiwara back to loving her in just instances. But the same lack of awareness that Shinomiya sometimes hates is why they're also friends in the first place. Because for a long time Fujiwara was, to some degree, Shinomiya's oldest and kind of only friend. Or a better way to put it is her only friend that doesn't work for her, because that leads to Hayasaka who's kind of her other best friend, and maid, and confidant, and kind of a spy, bodyguard, master of disguises, basically her therapist, but in reality just another teenage girl who goes to Shushin Academy. Also, Hayasaka's kind of the only person in the story fully aware of what's going on between Shinomiya and Shirogane. Now, at some point, Shinomiya challenges Hayasaka to seduce the president, saying it's not as easy as you make it out to be, and Hayasaka takes her up on the challenge. Now, she doesn't succeed in seducing him, but she does open up to him, and eventually they become close friends. Friends. And while he doesn't really like her, she kind of does like him because Shirogane is actually a very cool person. For example, he helped Ishigami when he was at potentially his darkest moment in life. He also stepped in and helped Miko Ino when she was struggling in front of an entire audience of people. But Shirogane's relationship with Fujiwara highlights he's far from perfect. He sucks at things when he starts them for the first time, and Fujiwara sadly stumbles upon that a couple times, and being the good-hearted character she is, tries to help him. That process ends up being a little bit torturous each time, because while Shirogane is very often selfless in the way he helps others, he also sometimes needs help in overcoming his own shortcomings. Which leads us back to Fujiwara, who's idolized by Miko Ino. Now, Ino and Ishigami do not get along, except for the fact that they are constantly secretly looking out 
for one another. Despite their differences, or rather their similarities, they're constantly doing things to support one another because while they're frustrated by each other's idiosyncrasies, they also believe the other person's pretty good-hearted. Now, Ishigami and Fujiwara also kind of fall into that category, where they do get along, except for the fact that constantly Ishigami crosses social boundaries for Fujiwara, which is crazy because she's so socially unaware. Now, the same idiosyncrasies that make Ishigami so socially unaware and unskilled are also part of what allow him to be so adamant in his morals despite immense social pressure not to be. Which reminds me a lot of Miko Ino. Part of the reason they don't get along is because they're so similar. Now, Miko Ino's best friend, Osaragi, can see these similarities and multiple times goes out of her way to try to advocate for Ishigami. Specifically, the best example is when Ishigami joins the cheer squad and Osaragi goes out of her way to talk to the president and vice president of the cheer squad to advocate for Ishigami, saying that she doesn't think he joined as a joke. The two people she reached out to actually end up being important. The first is named Kazuno, and Kobachi and him end up dating. And the second is a third year girl named Koyasa Subame. She's very sweet-hearted and very kind, and Ishigami ends up developing a crush on her. And while that situation is super cute, it also causes him to open up and share the fact that he has this crush with Shinomiya. Now, Shinomiya and Ishigami's relationship is super interesting. Now, Ishigami is terrified of Shinomiya, having experienced the full extent of her emotional mood swings. However, their relationship shifted a lot multiple times throughout the second season. For example, when he's at risk of being held back if he fails another class, Shinomiya dedicates a lot of precious time during finals season to help him. Not only that, but when Ishigami's terrified to reach out to a female student to ask if he can borrow her uniform, Shinomiya offers it without hesitation. This also leads to this really cool visual representation of Shinomiya's internal conflict, the different parts of herself that are warring with one another, these almost personas that make up who she is. Initially represented as the angel and devil on her shoulder, there's actually three personalities. The first being the grounded and cold Kaguya that developed in her youth. The second being the kind-hearted and optimistic Kaguya that came with getting to know the president. And the third being the child version of Kaguya. I think it'd be really easy to look at these three different parts of Kaguya through Sigmund Freud's elements of personality, specifically the id, ego, and superego. Now, Sigmund Freud was an Austrian neurologist who was born in 1856. Oh, right, sorry, off topic. So essentially there's all these different interesting and dynamic relationships between the characters, some I didn't even cover. Like how when Hayasuka's around Fujiwara, she's actually Mr. Hayasuka, forced by Shinomiya since middle school to dress up as a young man as to not blow her cover whenever Fujiwara spent the night. Or Shinomiya's interesting relationship with Shirogane's father and sister, both of which already think very highly of her while she desperately tries to gain their approval that she doesn't know she has. Or Hayasuka's relationship with Ishigami, Wait, no, there's actually nothing there. All of these characters work wonderfully with the plot, which is what we're going to talk about next before going into the final section of the video, the product. I think the plot in Kaguya-sama Love is War is not the priority. Remember, this is a love story, yet I find myself so easily distracted by all the things that aren't the A plot. The characters, the writing, the gimmick, they're all amazing, and the B plots are so engaging that it's easy to lose track of time. But the story is ultimately about love. And while our story centers around Shirogane and Shinomiya, there's a lot of other interesting explorations of love. Take for example Ishigami and his crush on Subame or the budding feelings of Miko Ino that she's struggling to come to terms with. For me, when I was watching this show, I forgot the premise. I was so interested in everything else that was going on. Before I knew it, I forgot the fact that this was a drawn out love confession. Season three's finale snuck up on me, not literally in the episodes leading up to it, I could see it coming, but I forgot how much I cared about the main character's story. Because at this point, I was so invested in the characters. In another story or another context, I would have been very upset for it to take three seasons to lead up to this moment. But with this show, it felt right. Despite how much I enjoyed all these different components, what made me want to make this hour-long video on Kaguya-sama Love is War was the most recent movie. Because I think the ultimate determining factor on the success of a romance story is the ability to continue the story after the confession. And Kaguya-sama's movie perfectly represents why I think the product is so strong. So we've taken this big and complex thing, which is the show Kaguya-sama Love is War, and broken it up into different components so that we can analyze it to try to kind of understand it a little bit better. And something I've said a couple times throughout this video is that it's hard for any of these individual components to exist in a vacuum. The context that surrounds them is important because how all these different individual components interact and work together ultimately determines the quality of the product. Now, my stance on the show is probably pretty obvious given the fact that I've just made an hour-long video talking about the subject. And in this third section of the video, I want to focus primarily on Kaguya-sama's movie. 
But before we do that, I have a couple questions. What's the point of media? Or more specifically, why do we tell stories? I'm not sure there's a definitive answer to this question, but I have spent all day thinking about it and talking about it with my roommate, and we came up with a couple ideas. People wanna share things. And when I say that, I mean two different types of sharing. The first being someone sharing an idea or a feeling with another person, and the second being a joint experience between two people that's shared. I think media is capable of, and often does, express these two different types of sharing. Human beings are inherently social creatures. Our culture that we survive on is built around collaboration. There's an overwhelming amount of scientific research that showcases the dangers to the human psyche that comes with isolation. If we were to oversimplify a little bit, I think outside of the base needs of sustenance, most of what human beings do is pursue connection. And this reminds me of that really famous quote, art is a lie that tells the truth. Because the human condition and experience is pretty complicated, and there's this thing I call magnitude translation loss, where the magnitude of spectacular moments is dampened when captured by cameras in film or photography. For example, if you've ever been awed by the size of something, like a mountain or statue, and tried to take a photo, more often than not, it doesn't really do it justice. And human experiences are magnificent and complicated and overwhelming. So you can see how it could be difficult with something like magnitude translation loss to properly express those feelings or a story in a piece of art. That's part of what makes Kaguya-sama Love is War so fantastic, is they're doing something that's really difficult very well. So many love stories don't know where to go when the two love interests get together. It's a hard thing to navigate. In this video, I've made fun of a lot of shows for not really exploring beyond the confession, but in reality, I think that's just a byproduct of the difficulty of exploring that story. Because if we were to zoom in a little bit on stories rather than media, I think that the goal consists in two different factors. The first is being entertaining, and the second is being emotionally resonant. Because I think if you were to look at almost any substantial piece of fiction, it'll consist of one, if not both of those things. Now this is just a baseline, obviously there's more to storytelling than these two things. An important clarification is that when I'm talking about emotional resonance, it might be intuitive to think of the more pronounced emotions like happiness and sadness or something like love, but I'm also talking about the small emotions too. Excitement, intrigue, discomfort, stuff like that. So how does this apply to Kaguya-sama Love is War, and more specifically, it is a product? This show has solidified itself as one of my favorite love stories of all time. It has repeatedly and consistently surprised me. Whether it was my first viewing, when I was enamored by its charm, humor, and execution, or in my second, when I realized how much depth there was beyond the gimmick. Or maybe even when I was diving deep into this show for this video and realizing just how many different components work fantastically together. Once again, I've just been repeatedly and consistently shocked at the quality of the product. You know that old saying, when the whole outweighs the sum of its parts? Well, that happens when parts of art work together cohesively in a way that's multiplicative instead of additive. If you were to take all the different parts of a story, give them a numeric value, add them together, and then average them, you could theoretically gauge the quality of the project. But in reality, all these different components interact with one another and impact each other. It's like that optical illusion where the same color will look drastically different depending on the context around it. My favorite example of this is the song I Really Want to Stay at Your House by Rosa Walton from Cyberpunk Edge Runners. It's a song that I don't think I would like without the context of the show, except for the fact that I did watch it in the context of the show and it's amazing how much of an immediate emotional response it evokes in me. Context can influence heavily how we interpret art. And like I said earlier, I think stories kind of serve two purposes, the first being entertaining and the second causing emotional resonance. And both of those things are not incredibly subjective systems. It's not always easy to express why something hit so hard for you in the way it did. Because some pieces of art work better than you think they should. If you were to take different components of it and place them in a vacuum, they can't possibly represent the quality of the product in your experience. And that's a byproduct of when those components are not just working well together, but going beyond that and making the things around them better. I think Kaguya-sama Love is War is one of these examples where each individual component, while outstanding, also are made better by their surrounding context. Because in retrospect, revisiting the show so many times, I'm surprised at how many different parts of Kaguya-sama work in conjunction to build the story it ends up becoming. 
For example, the gimmick ends up being so much more than just satirically poking fun at common tropes. It works remarkably well in conjunction with the character writing and the plot. It's an incredibly fun setting for us to get to know the characters, and at times it's a very necessary break from heavy and intense moments. There's this term from a practicing therapist that I really like named Dr. K called coming up for air. A common coping mechanism when processing and working through intense emotional moments is to make a joke or a laugh. And we get that constantly in Kaguya-sama Love His Work as they deal with some pretty heavy topics, while also not losing sight of the fact that this is a comedy romance show. Another great example is all the different character traits that I thought were originally being played simply for laughs, but ended up being incredibly crucial for each character's growth like Shinomiya's cold tendencies or Shirogane's need to prove himself. Which leads us to our two main protagonists, Kaguya Shinomiya and Miyuki Shirogane. Across the three seasons of the show leading up to this movie, you learn so much about these two characters, like learning about their upbringings and understanding how that affected the people they are today. Kaguya's cold personality is a byproduct of her environment. Growing up as a member of the Shinomiya family, she was constantly riddled with extreme expectations. The standard was to be perfect, and when you didn't meet it, there was consequence. From an early age, they prepared her for socioeconomic and social warfare, which led to her being cold, calculated, manipulative, and critical. And in being who she was taught to be, she kept hurting people, so she chose to distance herself. But in distancing herself, people's longing for her approval only grew, which resulted in a vicious cycle that she couldn't escape. That was until Miyuki Shirogane changed her mind. He comes from about as inverse of a situation as possible. He grew up in a family with no money, so he's constantly trying to prove himself because of his lack of social and economic status. He embraces his good-hearted nature and constantly practices helping and supporting others, especially given the fact that in his first year at Shushin Academy, he was struggling immensely and the former president of the student council went out of his way to support him and build his confidence. That in conjunction with this backstory we find out, where he failed his elementary and middle school entrance exams and blames himself for his mother leaving and abandoning them, it showcases the fact that these are strong characters. And more than anything, they have incredible chemistry. Too often in television shows and movies, characters with no reason to love one another end up together. So it's incredibly refreshing when a story like Kaguya-sama comes along and makes characters that work so well together and have such incredible chemistry. And I think it all starts with admiration because to some degree, the show is trying to answer the question of why do these two characters love each other? And while there's lots of examples like kindness, work ethic, and achievement, I think you can take most of the reasons they want to be together and simplify it into two major components. First, there's just chemistry, which we just talked about. And second is they like who they want to be because of this person. My brother's getting married this summer, and something that I very distinctly remember when he met his now partner was the idea that it doesn't really matter where you are today, much more important is where you're going when it comes to friendships and relationships. Because I think a big part of love, whether or not it's romantic or platonic, is finding people to grow alongside. People who will challenge you and call you out based off of a foundation of love and support. So with Miyuki and Kaguya, there's this foundation to the relationship based off of trajectory and not just achievement oriented trajectory like being the president and vice president, but more specifically moral trajectory because loving this person helps them grow and become better. A really cool example of this is understanding Kaguya's goals in growth. Something she expresses multiple times throughout the series is that she had a very pessimistic view of the world. And that makes sense given the environment she grew up in and the expectations that were placed on her. And in meeting Miyuki Shirogane and seeing him act so selflessly time and time again to support others, she found hope again. And a reoccurring theme that they don't necessarily hit you over the head with that I found a lot throughout this show is that change doesn't come overnight. After someone's made a decision that they want to adopt certain practices, it takes time to adjust. So when I found out that Kaguya was trying to be kinder and to go out of her ways to be selfless when she otherwise wouldn't be, suddenly episodes in the first season had a substance to them that I never even realized. Take for example the episode where she has that one opportunity to walk to school, only immediately to find a child crying and alone who she feels obligated to help. When I first watched the show, I didn't really think much of the decision, but in retrospect, it actually works perfectly with her arc. 
She reluctantly helps this kid because she knows it's the right thing to do and it's how she's trying to act even though every bone in her body pushes her to act selfishly. All those lessons of doing everything you can to get ahead in the world are pretty deeply ingrained in her habits. There's also that episode with the French exchange students where Kaguya totally goes off on the girl and she's actually very ashamed of that when talking to Miyuki, feeling like she just reverted to her same old self. But he, who at first you thought was completely unaware of the situation, actually had a pretty decent understanding that she was badmouthing him and he couldn't really do anything in response. He voices his appreciation and it means a lot to her. There's actually a shockingly large amount of moments throughout this story where understanding the bigger arcs of the characters actually gives you a more informed understanding of the depth going on. Which is funny because I'm not even convinced with the author's intent that he meant to do that. But also, it kind of doesn't really matter. It works. I can't remember who it was, but one time I heard someone argue the idea that poorly written romances are what result in so many different ships. That more often than not, romance is built off of chemistry first and logic second. The point being, while some people might ship different relationship dynamics in Kaguya-sama Love is War, I think that this story is one of the few that there's no denying that these characters are the right pair. From their quirks to their triumphant moments, there's really no question to me, no room for debate. These characters are written in a way that's in touch with a real relationship. And to me, once you understand the context of who they are, there isn't really a second where I think they're not meant to be together. What's also really sick is I really like who they're trying to be because of one another. I think that healthy relationships push people to be better. And it's cool to see this represented in a series in a way that doesn't feel shoehorned, forced, or cringy. And I think that's a fine line to walk. It's really easy to feel very preachy when it comes to themes in a story. But I didn't experience Kaguya-sama like that at all. And I think a big reason for that is because the characters in this story are flawed and they have conflict that works in conjunction with those flaws. Which leads to the next part of analyzing the product as a whole, which is the movie's conflict. What do you do after a confession to make a show interesting? In most series I've watched, the answer is make contrived and unnecessary conflict that is built off of unreasonable miscommunication that undermines all the character growth we've observed so far. I hate when stories make the decision to have characters act in ways that don't line up with who they are just to create conflict. And at first, when I was watching Kaguya-sama's movie, I was worried. I was nervous at the direction they were taking it. Essentially, what happened is after the confession, Kaguya and Miyuki are both struggling to really figure out what their relationship is. Miyuki's hopeful that maybe they're boyfriend and girlfriend now, but Kaguya is struggling with the fact that when they kissed, she thought that you make out with someone that you're in love with and you use tongue, and then suddenly there's all this drama behind it because that that's a grown-up kiss or maybe a precursor to things like sex. Which by the way, I think this show actually handles, generally speaking, the topic of sex very responsibly, not the OVA. But jumping a little bit ahead, essentially Kaguya decides to let her cold side out again. She takes down the handkerchief that she uses as a bow, which by the way, Miyuki saved in the water at one point. I think that's pretty cool and significant, which also kind of represents her naive and optimistic side. And then suddenly we get the Ice Queen Kaguya with her hair down. And this weird thing happens where it feels like she kind of goes back to staturing saying it's naive for the president to assume that one kiss would mean that they're dating now, even though that's what she wants. But in reality, the goal is a little bit different. Kaguya is realizing that in winning over Miyuki's heart, to some degree, she's presented a false persona. And she's nervous that central parts of who she is, like her colder side, are unlovable and might cause Miyuki to pull away. And in line with her character, a strong, manipulative young woman who will push for what she wants. She realizes she doesn't want a relationship where she's hiding parts of herself because she wants to know if the person that she cares so much about will actually love her for who she is, not a persona she's created. I think what they're doing is taking all the different components of the show that worked before, like the gimmick, and incorporating them into a very significant and meaningful moment. Because the whole point of the gimmick is to posture, manipulate, and connive to trick someone into confessing their love to you. So when they finally express how they feel, suddenly the foundation of the entire relationship relationship undermines the authenticity of the confession. Because the question is, do they really love each other or do they love the personas that they presented? Because both parties involved are scared that if they show their true selves to each other, then the other person might be disenchanted, lose interest, and no longer love them. 
I mean, it's incredibly melodramatic, but that's what being a teenager in love is, right? Plus, no matter how old you are, it does not come easy to open up to someone completely, to bear the parts of yourself that you're self-conscious of, especially ones that could act in opposition so strongly to what you want, which is the approval of someone you admire. So in exact opposition to my main concern with post-confession conflict, this not only doesn't undermine the character's development, it works perfectly with the arcs that have been established so far. It's an incredibly relatable struggle that's executed very well, and I was very nervous it wouldn't be, but the direction they take it is fantastic. Because something I strongly believe that I think Kaguya-sama is starting to explore, especially in this movie, is that there's a significant difference between longing and love. I think falling in love with someone and going through that process is a crucial part of any love story, but I think it makes up a small percentage of the entire experience, which is being together, learning and working through the difficult parts of sharing a relationship, trying to grow, navigating conflict and communication, all of which is happening with extreme emotions and excitement and new experiences where you're navigating something very new to you that society values a lot, like romantic connection. Relationships are complicated, intimate, and vulnerable. Communication doesn't come easy, and I think that there's many stories that could be told exploring that. Yet so many love stories stop at the first kiss. It's all the chase and the honeymoon phase, but love is more subtle than that. Love takes time, and more than anything, it takes effort. Which, by the way, it's so nice to finally have competent characters fight for what they want in a love story. Which is what we see from Kaguya and Miyuki throughout this story, and especially when they have that moment in the park at the end of the movie, where they address their feelings and they express themselves, and suddenly they realize that the things they were so self-conscious of, the things that they thought if they were to admit would make the other person no longer love them, were actually crucial parts of the personality that made them fall in love in the first place. And this is all built off of a foundation of remarkable animation, tons of overwhelmingly cute moments, great writing and comedy. This movie is a culmination of all the different components that make the series work so well throughout the three seasons before it, where the whole somehow still outweighs the sum of its parts, despite the fact that the parts are freaking outstanding. And it's all capped off with a remarkable monologue from the narrator that I think is incredibly substantial. So I'm going to read it back and then I'm going to talk about it. First you fall in love, then you confess and find it returned in full. Ask anyone and they'll say this is a wonderful thing, but they're so very wrong. What people really love is the idea of love. Feelings can only reach so high before they come crashing down to the dark depths. The true yearning is for the game. There's nothing beyond the naming of the victor. No telling if that person is your soulmate. Eternal love may not even exist but you'll never know for sure if you don't take the plunge. Just arm yourself with the sharpest of minds before attempting the near impossible feat of finding true love. Let your heart man the helm. Let your brain navigate that sea, lest you stray from the course. For only those who use their mind can ever hope to attain the legendary true love. That monologue works perfectly in line with the self-awareness that made me love the show to begin with, except for the fact that it's not being presented satirically at all, it is just coming from an authentic place. And obviously, I agree with this sentiment immensely, because multiple times throughout this video I've argued that there is this disconnected understanding of what love is in media and culture. So if you look at the entire product of Kaguya-sama Love is War so far, it got better every time I watched it because it's just fantastic. If you got through this video, congratulations. That is crazy. I am currently on the verge of looking for new work, but before I do that, I put a lot of effort into this video to see if I could potentially support myself a little bit more stably doing something like this. So if you do want to support me, go to patreon.com slash pay the musician or click the link in the description where there are currently three Patreon exclusive video essays that I actually love each and every one of. I'm going to be uploading a couple more in the coming weeks and I plan to eventually make an entire catalog that's exclusive to Patreon for my Patreon supporters. Maybe the difference between me having more or less time to actually dedicate to making videos. Thanks for watching the video. Okay, bye.